And I believe God wants us to be significant. Not necessarily successful in the eyes of the world, but significant. And significance, I think, comes through serving. And by doing for others what they cannot do for themselves, I, I think you, you get that sense yes. of, of significance and you, you reach that milestone of significance. So I, I think, uh, yes, I love this country, but I think God has shown his love to this country and his grace to this country because, as uh, Psalms 33 talks about, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And this nation... Uh, through most of its history. And I, I would have to say that I think we're straying from that today. But God has clearly been. Jehovah, God, Jesus Christ, has been the Lord of this nation. As a result, we've been a blessed nation. We have sent out more missionaries. We have done more to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ than any nation on earth. And so therefore, I, I sense not that America is you know, better than any other nation. Right. But America has been blessed by God, I believe, for a, a, a very significant role to play. And for that reason, I feel that serving this nation is a part of serving God. And you do that now in Washington. I mean, just recently I was there with you in Washington. You gathered a lot of different pastors from a lot of different states. Uh, and it was, a, it was a neat gathering, one of the, the best gatherings. We've done this now six, seven years uh, that we've been able to do that. I've been up there. And I think this was so key because... There was such a passion there to pray for our nation, uh, a passion for truth, a passion for purpose of reaching people, mm -hmm. making a difference in the communities that we serve. What are some of the ways you feel like you're serving? Just tell people what you do now in Washington as you represent churches, as you represent uh, you know, all the different people. Well, what we do primarily, the, the Family Research Council, we work on public policy as it pertains to families from a Judeo-Christian worldview. We're unapologetically Christian. We believe the Bible. Uh, has uh, not just good stories to tell, but has principles under which we uh, can govern our lives and govern uh, ourselves as a people. And historically, we have as a nation. And so we argue for those principles to apply to public policy. Now, a part of, uh, of what we have done since I've been there in the last seven years is increasingly reach out to pastors and churches. Because I will tell you, as I said at the beginning, our problems in this nation are not political. Now, we wrestle with them in the political realm, but those are symptoms of a much greater problem. And I would say that the greatest problem facing America today is not, as I said, political, but spiritual. And if we're to change America, if we're to bring true change, uh, change that will have eternal significance, it's going to require that men and women who love the Lord Jesus Christ begin to live out the words that Christ left us. And that means that we love him by obeying him and by serving others. We stand for the truth unapologetically. Yeah. And I think there is a deficit of, of uh, those wanting to stand for the truth today. Now, let, let me say this. I believe we must stand for the truth, but we must speak it in love. If you That's see good. that connection, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that grace, uh, that mercy is to be there with truth. Love is to be there with truth. And so when we proclaim the truth, we do so out of redemptive heart. Why do we say that, great. that marriage should be between a man and a woman? Why do we say that homosexuality or adultery or premarital sex is wrong? Well, number one, God says it is. But God doesn't just say it so that he can deprive us of some benefit. We know through the social science research that those who engage in those behaviors are going to be at risk for other health factors, other psychological problems. But more than that, it stands as a barrier to them and a relationship with Jesus Christ. So why do we say that there are standards by which we should conduct ourselves? Number one, God says so. But as Paul says, the law is a tutor. Yeah. The law points us to the fact that we need a Savior. So as if we tear down every a moral barrier in our culture today, and it's all green lights in terms of sexual immorality, wow. where are the tutors? Where are the signs pointing to the fact that we need a Savior? And so our stand that we take for righteousness in our culture today should always be out of a desire to see men, women, and children come to know Jesus Christ and come into that fullness of life, not just eternal life, but the fullness of life that God has promised. 
You know, one of the things that you were talking about that, our stand for Christ, and our need of a Savior. What do you say to a person who says, you know what, I have my faith, it's personal and it's private. So why would it even be involved with the, with the political system? Why would it even be involved with the process? What do you say to a person who says, you know, how do you, how do you work through that? Well, you know, it's interesting. You say, you know, it's a private, my faith is a private matter. We know Jesus dying on the cross was not a private matter. It was a very public matter. In fact, it was put on the main highway on display so that all the world could see the agony, the, the shame, and the humiliation that Jesus Christ went through for me, for my sins, and for yours. Which is freedom. It's freedom. Yeah. It is, you know, if, if the Son has set you free, yeah. you shall be free indeed. And so through that relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, there is this freedom. Now I tell you, when I married my wife, I didn't do it in secret. Yeah. <laughs> no. And if I were to That's go good. about, if I were to go around today, look, look what's on this finger. I, yeah. I wear this. In fact, I just came back from a, uh, I took my daughter uh, on her senior trip. We went, to, it was different my senior trip. My senior trip was boot camp in California. <laughs> I took her whitewater rafting. And, and I, I always wear my wedding ring. In fact, you can see the, this discoloration around my finger where, the, where I didn't get the suntan. If I were to tell my wife, you know, honey, I love you, but you know, I just don't want anybody to know about it. Yeah. How long do you think that relationship would work? Do <laughs> you think that she would be honored by the fact that I wanted to hide my relationship with her? Yeah. I think it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. He wants to be honored by our public expression of our love and our relationship with him. It's nothing to hide. Are we ashamed of our relationship with Jesus Christ? I certainly am not ashamed of my relationship with my wife. Yeah. I love my wife. I've been married 25 years, and uh, I want everybody to know that we're married. Yeah. And I want everybody to know my five children are a product of that marriage. Amen. Come on. The same thing with Jesus Christ. I think he wants to be honored by our public recognition of our relationship yeah. with him. It's, it's, not a, it's not a private matter. It's who we are, and it should be seen in everything that we do. You know, when you think about that, how does someone, you say, how does someone practically take their faith and, and, and pray, support? What would you say to someone who says, I want to make a difference. I, wanna, I want freedom to remain in our nation. I, I want to have the freedom to express in crisis. And, and a lot of that is under attack right now. Oh, absolutely. And so what does a person that's watching this, what can they do to continue to let freedom reign in their life? Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to what we said earlier, and that is, I think it starts in prayer, uh, because I've always been very hesitant. People come up to me now for a number of years since I've been in the public life, saying, "You know, uh, how would you suggest I get started?" Hey, look, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how God has shaped you, created you, and what God's plan is for your life. And so, what I would say is, pray. Commit to this six months that you're going to begin to pray and just begin to pray for this nation and keep a journal and begin to pray and you'll see something. I, I guarantee you, you will begin to get God's heart for this nation, for the community in which you live and, and you'll begin to get a sense of, 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 of urgency and a, and a burden and you will find yourselves, and this happens to me even to this day, I will be in my prayer closet which I do every morning, and sometimes I'll begin to weep uncontrollably because I begin to, to feel God's heart for this nation or for particular people. And I believe when we've come to that point, then we're prepared to begin to minister. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would also add this. I would say do not despise small opportunities. My whole, uh, I guess what you could say, ministry and what I'm involved in today started over 25 years ago when I had an opportunity to do a weekly commentary on a, uh, a local radio, a Christian radio wow. station, uh, five minutes a week at 7 o'clock on Saturday morning when only two people were listening, <laughs> my wife and myself. Yeah. And I did that for about five years. And what I found, though, was that the Lord was using that to yeah. develop abilities within me. Now I have a radio program that's uh, heard on about 400 stations a day. So... Don't despise those small opportunities because know that God wants to, to take that and shape you and prepare you and, and equip you. But if your heart is right before God and you are praying and asking and you are burdened, I can guarantee you this, that God will not burden you 
without giving you an opportunity to make a difference. How do you pray for our nation, our president, 